Troy. Hi, hi. Hi, Troy. Nice to see you. Uh, we are still waiting for a moderator to come in. Yeah, he is here in the room, but I'm just not able okay. to switch on. I think. Sure. Okay, he's well, uh, he's not be... able to do. He's not able to start. So maybe the topic, uh, Troy, today is um, how can um, how can we activate India's R and D potential and using data and analytics. Uh, as you know, India today spends uh, only 0.6% uh, of its uh, GDP on R&D. It's one of the lowest in the world. Uh, it's okay. Okay, let's 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 hand over the mic. Yes. Okay, over to you, Tyagrajan. Okay, great to have you here, Tyagrajan. You're here. Or due to some technical uh. difficulty, are you able to see me now? Yes. Yeah, so I am very sorry. There was a technical glitch. Uh, welcome to this particular session on integrating data analytics with R&D. So uh, I have uh, with me uh, remarkable uh, data sciences specialists who have uh, great credentials on this subject. Um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Srikant Velumkani, uh, who is co-founder and co group chief executive and executive vice chairman of Fractal. Fractal is one of the leading players in artificial intelligence and digital transformation. Fractal's mission is to power every human decision in the enterprise and to use power of AI to help world's most admired Fortune 100 companies. Uh, Srikant's passion for AI analytics has made him the thought leader in the space and an admired public speaker. And we are fortunate to have him. We also have Mr. Troy Sadowski, founder of Data Logical Services Australia. Uh, Troy Sadowski, BSc, MBA, CTO, is one of the world's leading data science specialists. Troy is a pioneering data scientist that serves leading businesses, international governments, and research institutions globally with more than 20 years of experience in data integration solutions. Uh, his work in the area of cancer research also is relevant to today's uh, topic. Um, with that a brief introduction, uh, I, I, uh, I am inspired by your work, uh, Srikant. It will be wonderful if you can share uh, with us uh, what you have done in helping the companies integrate the data analytics with their R&D endeavor, whether it's a new product introduction or it is expanding and reaching out to new markets. Over to you, Srikha. Thank you, Jag Rajan. Great to be here. And Sorry, I'm getting an echo here. Can be an, okay, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, as you know, uh, India spends roughly 0.6% of its GDP on R&D, and uh, it is much lower compared to the rest of the world. And therefore, it's even more important that India makes the most of its R&D. My experience of working with R&D teams around the world has been around uh, making a new product introduction more successful. As you know, uh, around the world, 95% of all product launches fail because they don't end up meeting their desired revenue or other performance goals for those uh, for those innovations. And our goal as Fractal is to use analytics and AI to help them in cutting short the cycle of new product introduction and in making the probability of success higher. As an example, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this story of uh, a major consumer goods company that we are working with where we were trying to understand consumer behavior around usage of their product. Sometimes in, in case of R&D, you realize that you built a product for a certain need, but there are other kinds of needs that consumers have discovered for themselves and how to use product. And sometimes it can, it can lead to a breakthrough insight. And here we were, we were trying to understand uh, the usage of this toothpaste, which is a sensitive toothpaste. It is told that one in five people need a sensitive toothpaste because their teeth are sensitive. But once we started researching this topic and understanding how people are actually using sensitive toothpaste, there's a vast majority of people who don't realize that they need a sensitive toothpaste. But the others are using it for in very various purposes that we were not intended. One of those we figured out was that people who have cancer uh, have an, an undergoing chemotherapy, uh, you need a sensitive toothpaste. 
and uh, similarly if uh, other medical conditions we, for example osteoporosis can also lead to uh, sensitive teeth which may need sensitive toothpaste and because of having understood that by the conversations that are going on on the internet and the kinds of emails and letters that this this manufacturer was receiving we could repurpose the toothpaste for sensitive category and we could also create a specific sensitive sort of application device which actually helped the cancer patients so it actually not only informed a new use for an existing product it informed the creation of a new product for a segment that was really literally underserved uh, and and this firm could actually serve that segment because of having monitored uh, the social media having monitored the letters and 1800 calls that they were getting and using all of this data to understand which of those segments that they were underserved that's one example uh thank you shrikant that's very interesting uh, uh but, but tell me you can get this data by a normal market research or a you know focus group discussion uh do do you, do you mean to say that market research uh is replaced by consumer analytics i think it's augmented and significantly improved uh today i i think in in market research we always working with small samples we already have a hypothesis we are asking uh, questions and trying to confirm hypothesis so it doesn't lend itself into as much discovery as uh, you know un uh, unasked unaided que questions and discussions that are happening around the world on any topic and even given how much conversation is happening on the internet today uh, we there is the just the size and scope and just the long tail of those conversations is really vast so a market research exercise can never capture this really long tail of conversations and therefore you if you really are trying to find new niches and new products and so on i think it's it's absolutely uh, imperative to both use your own market research and continue that but add this vast trove of data and intelligence that's coming from the world around around us so it's it's an augmentation play eventually you might say that okay you may not need as much as, as much traditional market research the traditional market research has its own challenges we all know that i mean and therefore how can we put consumers in more decision making situations uh, make them do very i mean there are various ways in which you can you want the environment in which you are uncovering this data to be natural so there are modifications to market research that are working but also we cannot ignore all the data that's coming from social media as well thank you yeah ma it is interesting it is uh, you know i do understand there is a sampling related uh, restrictions and uh, but when you have a massive data uh, it is possible to get to the bottom of it you you are also implying that a new product idea itself can come out right it, it is not that you you can share research after you are having an idea but as the data flows in on its own a new product idea also can emerge yes and i'll i'll give you one example right uh, look at food trends in around the world like all food trends start by some uh, creative chef or some someone trying to do something new right let's say they discovered saffron as a, a interesting spice that can really make a certain product better and from there uh, you know uh, some uh, you know rest restaurant or some high end restaurant experiments with that some food blogs start writing about that and after that it becomes a little bit more mass in terms of restaurants and then a consumer products company let's say unilever or someone looks at this and says okay here's a super food called saffron and now i'll have okay saffron tea or i have saffron in my something right there's a whole cycle of innovation but by being uh, monitoring what's happening on the world you can capture this early and figure out what is this next big trend for example greek yogurt is now a very big trend 15 years old but 15 years ago greek yogurt was the thing that was very popular in the us you could but actually you could monitor the social conversations around that and and uh, our team actually figured out that there is a need for a high protein yogurt which might be useful so you don't know it's called yogurt greek yogurt you still don't know that idea and form but you can the, the seeds of that idea can germinate from these kinds of analytics on the on on social media so i you touched upon that uh, you know 0.5% to 0.65% uh, gdp be spent on r&d in that context uh, cost uh, in india's context uh, versus this analytics i'll come back to you troy it is wonderful to have you here you are joining from australia or bhutan hello it's the 
Are you able to hear me? I'm hoping you okay. Me okay. I'm okay. I care. So you have a it's my yeah, there is little disturbance in your audio. Okay. I don't know, I'm running. Uh, so off, you have uh, a good network here. It's reporting that it's full. We can hear you now. So the uh, I, I I would like to know from you on cancer research specifically. Uh, okay. the analytics being used and and some breakthrough you can share with us your experience on that yeah so hopefully the audio is coming through okay and um, we can not work for me because it's um, very choppy for myself I'm gonna turn off my camera and see if that helps yeah please sir okay. No trial okay. is not. Uh, I'll, I, it is not. Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll so begin I, to answer your question. So, I just want to check one more time. Can you hear me? Yeah, in the meanwhile, I will uh, continue with Srikant. Srikant, the, uh, the thing is that uh, R&D engineers who are um uh, you know um they they come from an innovation mindset and um, the uh, you do you think in engineering companies they are oriented towards uh, ai or using data in an indian context how do you see that i think in general uh, like you rightly said the uh, uh, r&d r&d uh, people are uh, scientifically minded they want evidence. Their their science is how they've grown into an R and D position, and therefore the basic fact of evidence based decision making, evidence based uh, inquiry, is something that is very familiar to R and D uh, individuals. I think what we have realized in working with a lot of R and D teams around the world is that they may not have all the tools and techniques necessary because there's so much has happened in the AI world in the last. 10 to 15 years, they may not have all the tools and uh, AI tools necessary to uh, do R&D, but I think they're very quick to uh, quick on the uptake and very interested in this, and they they understand the value of something like this. So, as as an I mean, in general, what I have seen across all the products and services that I've you know worked with is that there are three distinct phases of how you can uh, build better products and services, right? And as as we especially with regards to AI. I think all products start with practically human intelligence embedded into the product. Like think, think of a car, right? I mean, we've had car automobile industries a hundred years old and every year it's in improving. You, there's a lot of R&D going on, improving the features of the product, but there's been no significant R&D investment or no significant AI or analytics inside cars till uh, 10, 15 years ago. Right. And then 10, 15 years ago, I think we moved from phase one of that to phase two. And what I would call as a, uh, inter intelligence and AI on the periphery, right? So you would have a car, but now uh, a General Motors would say, I have OnStar services because of which every piece of, you know, data that's from the car is getting going back to GM. So I can track where the car is. I can help you if this car breaks down. I can also see various parameters of the car and help use that data to improve the building of the car itself. So that's, I would say, a second phase where AI innovation is happening, but it's happening on the periphery of the, of the product. Right? So you're use bells and you're bringing bells and whistles, intelligent features to the product, but fundamentally car is the same. And then comes phase three of a product like a car where the car is reimagined using AI. So uh, a, a Tesla is a, is a, is a, is a software a computer on wheels, right? Is a piece of software on wheels and you can literally update the product overnight you can you, know, you sleep in the night and morning when you wake up you have a new car because this car is updated with new features because it ai is in it is learning and new features have been incorporated to make the car user experience better so it has been reimagined with ai and and this is still not over you can we can reimagine further it's not that it's one and done right it's you can further improve it so that's the cycle and i do feel like um 
we are every product will move across the cycle whether it is air conditioners or whether it is uh, cars or whether it is services banking or other services you will see that this three three phases are there and we are seeing mostly products come moving from phase 1 to phase 2 and that, that's why it's so exciting that there is a the whole world of intelligent products and services which can be reimagined using ai uh, wonderful uh, tell me in an existing product which is already launched it is being sold and how one uh, looks at uh, you know uh, in indian context again you are under uh, competitive pressure all the time you continue to do value engineering in order to drive down the cost and uh, you have any examples there on an existing product continuous improvement happening through ai yes i mean uh, we, we, specifically with india we, uh, you know, our footprint is generally low in india but working with ai using to innovate on existing products and services is very common i mean i'll i'll give you the example of working with the government of india uh, on uh, in, in around 2016 when india demonetized right and that's the time when uh, government of india had built the entire infrastructure around figuring out how how people are paying taxes it's a very nice very rich data on uh, how uh, you know customers are sort of individual population is sort of connected to each other and how the, what is the tax paying history etc it's very rich data set but this was a time when we had to find out how what was uh, uses of cash or what were some suspicious transactions that people were doing when india's 86% of india's currency was demonetized then all everybody started depositing cash and to understand that behavior and understand what are the fraud or what are the suspicious transactions there was required a lot of analytics in ai so that was where government had to innovate to find out that okay how can we make this the program had great intentions how does this this great intention translate into great success and therefore can we find out all the various people who are not, who are doing suspicious transactions so you would see that because of the world has changed around us or because new needs have come up or or uh, or the you know or, or just the uh, you know a covid-19 like situation like the world is evolving and in that world how can we innovate to stay current is is where we see that Uh, R&D uh, analytics and in, uh, in R&D is, is useful. One other example I will provide you is what we've been doing on uh, on uh, doing for uh, for tuberculosis in India. Uh, tuberculosis is one of the big uh, diseases in India, killing millions of people. Uh, it is, I think, uh, the one of the largest source, uh, largest fatality um, drivers within India, right? Um, and it's hard to solve because we don't have enough doctors to even diagnose for tb and because the cycle of di- diagnosis of tb takes several days and weeks patients are lost to follow up so how can we for example what we've done is to create a chest x-ray based solution which can detect tb now world health organization has approved this as a as a solution good solution for detecting tb so as at your dot ai what we can do is take an x-ray and immediately diagnose whether somebody has a tb tb uh, tb characteristics and then conf- confirm that with a test and therefore start their treatment literally in the same day as opposed to many weeks so within india and in philippines and across you know, 50 other countries around the world people are now using this to screen population for tb this was required because an a market like india does not have enough doctors so you have to come up with new ways to uh, to sort of uh, and and look at the x-rays and other things and try to solve for problems which cannot be solved with traditional solutions like doctors so that's really one example of uh, innovation being required because we really don't have the infrastructure we don't really spend as much money on on doctors and other things in india and the doctor to patient ratio is very very uh, low in india so how do we bring in ai techniques to help very useful um the uh, you know you you mentioned about uh, india footprint being low is the penetration also low yes yes absolutely i mean it it, it is fair to say that india has a lot of different uh, challenges and um, i think if you see uh, ai needs a lot of data so not every indian company has made enough investments in the data infrastructure or or the or the measurement thereof so so that and then the priorities may be different for uh, for indian companies and if growth is happening automatically india is growing very rapidly so just by doing existing products and taking it to new new markets or making incremental improvements to, new, to products you may be able to grow very fast so then you may not need feel the need for ai and analytics in a significant way because 
growth is coming easy profitability is, is coming easy it's when the markets become more competitive and a little bit more mature that you start feeling the real need for ai to drive some of the innovation uh, and that's when i think india will significantly expand even in the just in the last couple of years we've seen that uh, it's is taken off uh, adoption of ai in india has really significantly taken off i suppose in post covid actually also uh, interfaces are not available directly with the customers yes this may also trigger that but uh, i i also feel there is uh, you know the role of a ceo role of a cmo role of the uh, cto and cio uh, what what do you think is the right way to go about yeah um i think the the, uh, the role of a ceo i mean uh, a ceo in any in most situation as i have studied ceos i think are looking for firstly how to grow i think that's the biggest ch- uh, challenge that ceos around the world face and we do work with uh, several fortune uh, 500 and fortune fortune 100 companies and we see that the biggest challenge for companies is how to grow reliably um right and secondly how to stay relevant so they they want growth but they also want future relevance and so from that lens uh, they know that it will be very important for them to uh, use ai to find growth so you uh, have existing markets you have to find new markets you have existing products you have to find probably new product products maybe existing products but new segments you are looking at where what is the growth equation of the company look like and how can i use innovation r&d etc even marketing innovation in even sales innovation how can i bring in all kinds of innovation to drive ex- additional growth for my business so i think and therefore ai is very useful for for that a second point for most ceos is how can i stay relevant in future because my industry is getting disrupted a lot of startups are coming doing completely building on a new stack altogether and if i ignore them for too long they will come and take away my my business so i have to also stay uh, and build the new core of the business today i have a core that's working but i have to uh, in reinvent on the periphery and somehow bring it to the core right? and if, if again uh, taking the car example that i have a brilliant car business if i'm a ford or a general motors etc but i also know that tesla is going to come and eat away my share as electric vehicles take off so they're all in they have all invested significantly in electric vehicles over the last 5 years knowing that there's a time when they have to pivot to saying electric vehicles are my key vehicle and general you know ordinary normal motor vehicles are no longer core of my business that change is happening so they are also investing to stay in real future relevant so these are two places where i feel like they significantly need uh, analytics and ai and they are using it right now uh, i think troy is back are you able to hear us troy yes i've yeah so I, 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 i was interested in knowing uh, in cancer research yes. uh, you have done some phenomenal work it will be useful for you to share that yes thank you and yeah i apologize for the delay in the um issues there but um so my background is in data science and yes um my main interest and also experience has come through the cancer research area or domain of applying data science i i feel blessed actually to be a data scientist and have had that experience for over 10 years now um and data science and the data scientist role being quite a new field it um is really exciting to be a part of this um kind of initiative and movement that's uh, accompanying the world as the amount of data grows and the speed at which technology advances and yeah although my experience is in cancer research data science and the data scientist field um can be applied to any domain and uh in particular um what i've been able to achieve is uh looking for uh cancer causing agents in the workplace so i've been working with professors um in multiple universities around the world and uh how we went about that is actually through the application of data science now you may ask what is data science and a lot of people are still kind of not sure what the definition is because it is such a new field but i i can give you a definition today which is the scientific application of data and still like you may be thinking well what does that really mean 
but uh, we can look at that by looking at what the opposite would be. So the unscientific approach to data. The unscientific approach to data means that you don't actually look at it. You don't actually use it. You don't actually analyze it. And you don't try to derive meaning from it. And uh, this is happening all throughout uh, the world in terms of uh, businesses running their um, doing their day-to-day -day business, uh, governments collecting information, uh, IoT and devices uh, recording and picking up information. But the th fact is that there's a, an abundance of data everywhere. And it's now the role of the data scientists to actually come in and help people consume or, or make use of that data. And uh, yeah, so to talk more about the cancer research aspect is um, simply the, the process of collecting information that is related to what people do in their work, um, in tasks that they uh, perform. And then we have an expert system that's attached behind the uh, data, the questions that are collected to automatically uh, alert and identify whether or not there's hazards. And these hazards, these cancer causing hazards, um, you know, can range from uh, chemicals to, to noise, to sunlight. And um, yeah, my experience through the application of data science in that context has now allowed me to, you know, present and, um, be a part of this data science movement. I'm the owner of the data scientist group on LinkedIn, which now has over 106,000 members. And in that group, we... And how can we make use of the data that's available to individuals, organizations, communities, and the world? So my advice um, on you know how we can use data analytics in India in an R and D context is really to uh, allow and prepare for more data scientists to develop and practice their skills, and this can be done through uh, what we call you know innovation hubs or startup communities, more online meetings now because of COVID that um, are put, putting these restrictions on face-to-face -face meetings. But uh, we're looking at concepts like actually meeting up in virtual worlds where you can, as a character, emerge into a virtual space, look around, walk from one building to another and, you know, meet up with some people that are walking down on, on the other way on the street or come to a room where you're organized to meet your fellow data scientists, present and talk about what it is that you're working on and challenges that, um, you know, might be coming up. In this kind of enjoyable, fun environment of, of being able to learn and apply your data science skills. So, yeah, that's, I guess, the essence of what I wanted to say. And um, I hope so that didn't come too much of a distraction on that. Thank, thank you, Troy. Uh, you know, uh, to both of you, I have this question. Highly creative people, uh, you know, versus uh, number, data, analytics. I, I don't, don't you think that is a challenge? How do you, how do you cultivate this culture? Yeah. So I, I have often seen very highly creative people hate the numbers and analysis. So yes. I, 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 can, I can go first. Um, you're absolutely right that uh, there are the, uh, that there are diverse characteristics of people, and there are a whole host of people who are extremely creative who are do not like the entire idea of going into the numbers and actually doing the math math around that. that so that we, for example, we have a very um, a very robust team on behavioral scientists and designers people who really understand how humans actually make decisions. So Fractal's goal is 
to power every human decision so when we when we do that and using analytics and ai we have to also understand how humans actually make decisions and people who understand who how humans actually make decisions are behavioral scientists and design uh, researchers who who have get great empathy for how how people actually think and how people actually behave their emotions and so on unless you connect the two you cannot build great solutions and you have to create an environment where these this diverse set of people can actually work effectively with each other uh, so uh, most of the creative people work with the deep data not uh, it's it's white data it's 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 not sorry it's not deep it's white data uh, but not necessarily sorry i'm let me let me clarify that so they will talk to 20 20 customers 20 users right and do in depth research and understand the day in the life of of the 20 people right in fact um, someone like a martin lindstrom as a scientist he would go in live in people's homes for two days and just uncover some brilliant insights about how people actually are using products or what may be happening on the other hand you have this vast very very deep data on on the user behavior and that is coming from transaction systems and research and and even from uh, social media and so on Now you have to combine this relatively shallow data but very very interesting wide data with this very deep and data but may not have may not cover everything right so how do you bring the two together to build products and that's really the idea of adding design and data to solve problems and that's what actually we believe is uh, will change the game and that's really what we attempt to do in every problem that we solve uh, so- I, i think it is troy's uh, colleague or his friend uh, yeah. he has posted that there are 32000 data scientists in india alone in linkedin uh, you know, that's a surprising this- number to me actually. yeah it's actually the largest percentage of uh, people in the group which yeah like i mentioned has over 100000 um we now yeah 32000 of those are coming from india but um yeah i'd like to answer that question as well because i see um the layers or what we call perspectives can really help in identifying you know uh solutions to this problem when you ask about the creativity side and the analytical and the you know it's kind of like the left brain versus the right brain thinking but um we've seen in the data science process there's actually three different layers the first is what we call really hands on and this is the physical aspects of computing where it considers you know supercomputers it considers micro computers you know uh using little controller boards like like this um and putting it together and building up devices to collect data and that's what we call at the physical realm and people who uh, really I wanted to interrupt Troy it is also connected with one question yes. so we have to close in 3 minutes as a closing mark both of you can answer that question it is connected with the same what you are talking about okay uh, Mr. Uh, suket singhal you know this also say i even quite a few are smaller businesses so if you if you can read there i find that most companies get overwhelmed when they are faced by using uh, ai or ml they think it is like a 1000 pound gorilla uh, that they want to stay away from uh, so he he is asking few pointers to how smaller businesses can benefit uh, i think we are obliged to answer that question so try in uh, one minute and see can the one minute that must be our closing remarks as well yeah so So I can just continue with the answer I think because it's inside what I was about to say. Um a data scientist can be a data scientist but really hands on in 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 this space of the physical realm. Or they can be in this logical phase. What this is where artificial intelligence and machine learning and the logical transformation of data happens. And this is where we get those you know highly uh um mathematical in programming um type of people um are contributing and then at the top level is what we do refer to as the emotional perspective the emotional layer and this is where that human computer interaction comes in and you know the the trick is to find a balance between those three perspectives and that's the answer to be able to you know utilize these complex um algorithms in the in the logical layer ensuring that you have a physical layer that supports it 
and your emotional layer um, is given the right amount of attention so you can deliver the right information to the right people. Thank you, Troy. Uh, Shekhar, uh, we will be just closing with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tiagrajan. Uh, so uh, the question is about small businesses. How can we start if you're intimidated by data, etc.? I would say no need to uh, be intimidated. Start with the most important uh, metrics that you're chasing. It could be growth. It could be it could be market share. It could be something else. Just look at those. There's a top three metrics that you're chasing as, as a company and then see which of those areas can benefit from the from using data that you already may be having. So look at where you have the data as well, because you know, collecting data might take time and work backward from those decisions that can be enabled with data and then go so go back and find the data, build the algorithms and try to improve the decision. So my my point is not data forwards. Many people think let's collect all the data and then I go forward with doing analysis and then come to decision, work decision backwards, pick the two or three decisions that you can influence the most and pick one of those areas and build, try to bring some analytics, some intelligence in trying to improve the decision. Once you see success, you can try to build, collect more data. You can improve the techniques. You can improve the uh, everything else after that. But start with a decision, a couple of decisions in mind, work backwards from there. That's the best way to start for a small business. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Srikant. It was wonderful uh, chatting with you. Uh, I'm sure the audience would have enjoyed and uh, gained a lot of insights. All the best to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Troy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Thank you.